Hi, this is Scott from Spectre Gear uh, with another Tactical Shotgunner Pro Tip and we're still at the bench and we're going to dig a little deeper into defensive ammunition for 12 gauge shotguns. Uh, in the last video I talked kind of the anatomy of a um, shotgun round and I talked a little bit about some of the wounding characteristics and what this ammo does but we're going to delve a bit deeper because the overall intention of this video is knowing your load. And that is knowing what your load is going to do at given distances and whether or not those distances determine maybe switching to something else or aiming in a different way or operating in a different way. Um, so to begin with, uh, the last video, uh, we kind of eliminated birdshot as something to consider for defensive use. And I remain, uh, I'm resolute in that belief. I can't think of a whole lot of reasons to use birdshot except for extremely dire circumstances where you can't get your hands on anything else. And then there's some things you can do from that, but they're not all that spectacular. So we're down to buckshot and slugs. And we're going to start uh, what we're going to be talking about here with buckshot. The shotgun, at its roots, is a patterning weapon. It's designed to throw multiple projectiles in a certain type of pattern to do a certain type of thing. For birds, that's one thing. For people, that's something completely different. And though they, those two streams don't cross very effectively, to be honest with you. Uh, and there are a lot of misconceptions about shotguns that are out there uh, that I think people need to be educated on, and that's the purpose of what we're doing here. Um, so what we're going to start off with first is just a real quick discussion of barrel dynamics for shotguns because the, the barrel of the shotgun, um, along with the load, is going to determine the quality of the pattern that you get. And one thing to know about shotguns is that they are, by their nature, especially the defensive shotguns, they're not held to the same standards that a rifle barrel would be held to in terms of consistency of the bore. So shotguns are a little bit notorious, especially the cylinder bore types, uh, with sometimes having maybe a minor imperfection within the barrel that can create an effect with particular loads that create a thing called a donut effect. And what a donut effect is, is as the shot travels down range, rather than travel in an evenly dispersed group or any some kind of symmetrical pattern that has some pellets in the center, some a little further out, and some all the way out to the edges, uh, sometimes you can get a thing called a donut effect where as the pellets go out, they just immediately spread to the outer circumference and there's nothing. There's an absence of shot in the center and that's something you want to avoid. Um, now the good thing or good news on this is if you get a gun and you grab you know, a particular brand off the shelf and you go out to the range and right away, poof, you're, you're seeing donut pattern. The good news is you can oftentimes merely change the load and come up with a completely different result. So there's two concepts that you need to, to buy into when it comes to um, knowing loads and then, of course, shotgun barrel dynamics. And the first concept is not all loads pattern the same way for all guns. I, For instance, this particular load right here patterns very, very well in my Mossberg 500, which has a cylinder bore unmodified. It's not choked in any way. Uh, it's just a straight cylinder bore barrel, which is just a straight wall barrel, no choking involved. It patterns great in that barrel, but oddly enough, I put the same load in a gun that actually had a pretty advanced internal choking system, and it didn't pattern as well as the bone stock cylinder bore Mossberg 500. However, I know that particular shotgun patterns very well with Federal H132 Buck or Remington um, reduced uh, recoil law enforcement loads. So it's an interesting conundrum. So again, remember, not all loads pattern the same way for all guns. So if you're not getting a decent pattern or, or an acceptable pattern, switch to a different type of, of buckshot ammunition. If you're using Federal, go with Winchester or try some Remington or try something a little different within the brand. Instead of going with a classic, go with a premium. Or there's even some tactical loads uh, that can come into play that could change the equation completely with you. Now, another thing to consider, and this is for, for people that are issued a shotgun, um, these would be agency guns, is you need to understand that not all guns pattern the same way with the same load. So if you're an agency that utilizes Remington 870s and you have bought a certain type of ammunition on the state ammo bid, you get the shotguns out and you find out that, let's say, of those guns, 75% of them pattern adequately with that load, but there's a certain percentage that just don't. 
Uh, it sometimes is a good idea to have alternative loads for those guns if it's a gun that's going to be issued to a particular guy because he's going to lose confidence in a hurry in a shotgun if he realizes that it's no good out beyond 10 or 15 yards because of the way it's throwing a pattern. So those are two very important things. And it also points out that it's critical that you pattern test your loads and know what those loads will do at those certain ranges. And then if you get a good result, stick with that loading. Um, so it, it'll be a good match. But shotguns are like people. They like some things and some things they don't like. Um, some guns are pretty pretty generic and they'll handle a little bit of everything. But if you've got a little barrel imperfection, it's good to know that. Um, now there are some things you could do if you have a shotgun that's just not really throwing a, a, a good pattern with anything. Um, there are some choking systems that you can look into. Uh, you could buy another barrel, too, and try your result with that. It may actually be cheaper than going with choking, but there are some cho some choking issues you can get involved in. Uh, now, they're, they're based with three different types. One is external, and then two are internal. But you could go with a, a muzzle device, a, a, a choke that screws on to the uh, end of the barrel. Sometimes they stick out from the end of the barrel. Sometimes they're inside the actual end of the barrel. The problem with those is it's a temporary solution. They can come loose. Uh, and some of them can become a particular problem if you're going to fire any slugs through there. So that may not be the best result. What you might want to look into instead is either going with what's called a jug choke. Now a jug choke, what they do is they open up a, an area inside of the barrel and then create uh, basically an expansion chamber and then a constriction point to uh, institute some choking. And I, I believe those are usually done a little more out towards the end of the barrel. But those are kind of a half measure solution. I think the best internal choke that you could look into is the one done by VanComp. And what VanComp does is inside of the shotgun barrel, there is a forcing cone. And what that forcing cone does is when the, the shell opens up, and obviously the shell, um, if you try to stick one of these shotgun shells in the, in the muzzle of your shotgun, not going to fit. So this opens up, and so the chamber is obviously going to be larger than the bore. And there is a forcing cone, and basically we're just talking a ramp that constricts the shot down into the diameter of the bore, and then it continues down the barrel. Now, that can sometimes be a bit abrupt, and that could be one of the reasons that the shotgun is patterning bad to begin with. What VanComp does is they essentially lengthen and extend the forcing cone and make more of a gradual slope on it so that it sort of eases the shot into place rather than forcing it abruptly into place. And it's, uh, it's a very effective system. My business partner, Jeff, his 590 has a VanComp, and that thing's amazing. Um, I was, uh, my first exposure was at a gun site uh, tactical shotgunner instructor course, and uh, a lot of guys are running that, and it's a, it's a pretty amazing modification. So... Uh, that might be something to look into, because so that could affect your patterning. So when we've done this patterning test and we've determined, hey, we're we're keeping a fairly tight pattern, everything's pretty good. What does that then tell us about uh, how we're going to aim the shotgun and how we're going to operate the shotgun? And that's where we get into our uh, our A, B, and C zones. Uh, and basically, the the A, B, and C zones identify how the gun should be aimed and what load should even be in the gun based on the distance to target. Uh, and it sets up three different operational zones that are basically defined by what kind of pattern the gun is throwing at that distance. Now, the first zone is your A zone. And your A zone is going to be from muzzle contact out to plus or minus uh, three to five yards, somewhere in that range. And what we're talking about here is, and this is another um, myth and misconception that comes up from shotguns being used in movies. And I remember a uh, early on in life, I uh, I was watching a movie one time. It was one of the first times I ever, you know, got exposed to people shooting other people with shotguns. Now, of course, it's just a movie, but it was called uh, Walking Tall with Joe Don Baker. Excellent movie. But in one, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> just about choked myself to death. Um, in this movie, they had a they had a scene where. Somebody fires a shotgun in a bar. It's like from the end of the bar to a wall, distance about five to seven yards. But the pattern on it was like 50 to 60 inches. It was humongous. Um, and that comes from the misconception that when, when you fire a shotgun, what happens is the as soon as the pellets exit the barrel, they immediately button hook left and right, go to a defined distance, and then shoot the walls, <laughs> kind of like an entry team. Whew, and then they go down and they sweep an alley or a street and they kill everything in sight. No one survives. 
that's an, a bit of an exaggeration, but not by much. Uh, it's kind of like when people get shot with handguns and they fly five feet through the air, you know, knowing that every equal or every action re requires an equal or opposite reaction. If you fired around capable of taking a 200 man, 200 pound man off his feet and throwing him five feet through the air, it would produ produce the same amount of recoil on the opposite end that you're sitting on. It doesn't work like that. Um, so with shotguns, a lot of times people have a real serious misconception about you know, how much that shot spreads. Uh, and some people have just no concept whatsoever. A, a story, I think I dropped it on one of my shotgunner videos, or it's in there somewhere. But uh, there's this time that this, uh, this police chief decided to visit the range, you know, wave the flag and inspire his troops. And they were doing shotgun training. And he goes up to examine targets and sort of turns to the, uh, one of the officers shooting and says, hey, don't, don't worry, you keep practicing, you'll tighten those groups up in no time. Well, it's total lack of understanding of using a weapon designed to throw a pattern of six to eight to 10 inches, depending on the range. Uh, no amount of practicing is going to tighten that group. That's not the intent here. In fact, we're actually aiming for that group. We, we want that. We want those pellets to be that far apart. But there are just some people that just really don't understand the pattern. And I still hear the same old wives' tale of, you know, buckshot spreads at one inch per yard traveled. Um, no, it, it doesn't. Um, it definitely doesn't. And you'll find that out because that affects this A, B, and C zone. When So getting back to this, at the muzzle, as the pellets exit the barrel of a shotgun, they are no, that, that pattern is no larger or smaller than the bore of the shotgun. So we're talking three quarters of an inch at contact. Now, how your A zone is established and what the A zone is in terms of your pattern is at very close ranges, when those pellets exit the barrel, they are still basically a prefragmented slug. You have nine pellets, they're all in very close proximity, and they all hit in about the same area. So we're talking a pattern of from bore size at three quarters of an inch out to about two to three inches, somewhere in that range. What I look for is at the moment that I start to see individual pellet holes forming at the outside of the pattern, I know I'm at the limits of my range for the A zone. But if everything's still clustered together and those pellets are all still touching and it's one solid hole, that is the A zone. In the A zone, you aim that shotgun just like a rifle, just like a carbine. Um, you could very well miss your target completely if you don't do so. The, the concept of just keeping the shotgun at the hip in a hallway and just letting fly and it's going to kill everything in the hallway, literally, you could miss somebody at five feet. You could be completely off and miss them entirely at that distance. So you have to aim, aim and shoot just like you would a rifle or a carbine. In terms of wounding effects, um, what's going to occur when those nine pellets flying in close proximity to each other as a prefragmented slug, when they impact um, the target... The first pellets in a row, and, and it, they're not flying like a like a dinner plate. They're flying basically stacked. So you've got two or three up front, another two or three, another two or three. When those first pellets hit, they're immediately going to slow down, and then they're immediately going to be hit from the rear by the pellets behind them traveling at full velocity. And then that's going to be repeated again. So not only do you get a hole that's anywhere from three quarters to you know two to three inches not only do you get one hole where there is an absence of anything but air, but also you get that billiard ball effect of those pellets slamming into each other and then being driven off in different directions, uh, creating their own separate wound channels. In short, it's a devastating, devastating wound. So that's why it's called a tunnel wound or a rat hole wound, uh, almost non-survivable. Uh, it's, it's even the kind of thing, if you hit an extremity, you hit somebody in an arm at that distance, that arm is never going to work again. It is, it is going to be absent enough tissue to even be able to be repaired. So it's, uh, it's devastating. But as I said, at the moment, as you're patterning your shotgun, so you start at, you know, I usually just started off right away at about two full paces away. So that's about two to three yards. And then I kind of walk it back until that moment where I, I see that the, I'm starting to see pellets on the outside of that, that tunnel wound effect. I know that's where the A zone ends, and I'm beginning to enter the B zone. Now, the B zone is another area where the shotgun is, is just um, absolutely amazing. Uh, in the B zone, you now start to see and will see a fully developed pattern. 
And that pattern, and what I usually use to define that, and you'll see in the video that I do to support this, uh, this video, um, I use a reduced size B27 silhouette. So basically I have a 10 inch kill zone, um, uh, or I call it, I call it kill zone. I don't, I don't have to do use euphemistic soft language anymore. We can, I, I guess we can call it survivability uh, index zone or what have you. But suffice it to say, I'm trying to contain my pellets in basically something the size of a typical paper plate, about 10 inches. Once I see pellets begin to get outside of that 10 inches, I know that my B zone has ended. But the B zone, the interesting thing here is, we're not going to, at this point, be selective about where we put that. In the A zone, if I wanted to, I could put one right on somebody's nose. I could, if the only thing I had exposed to me was, you know, a, a shoulder area, I could actually take out a shoulder. There's a lot of things I can do with this. I can be very selective with where I put that pattern. But with the, the B zone, we're letting the pattern now do the work. Because wherever you put that, either the bead or your front sight, wherever you put that front sight, that is the center of your pattern. And your pellets are going to radiate outward from there. So the idea here is within the B zone, you go center mass. And the nice thing is, that's where you can be very fast with a shotgun. Because you don't have to be super precise. Uh, you don't have to aim for a specific button on a shirt. If you're basically, you know, minute of center mass, you are good to go. You press that shot, everything radiates out from there, and now you get nine pellets simultaneously striking and creating nine separate wound channels and disrupting nine completely different and unique internal organs at the same time, which equates to massive internal and external bleeding, uh, air in, juice out, reduction of blood pressure to the, or uh, supply of oxygenated blood flow to the brain, boop, suspect drops out. There's also mechanical considerations go into that. I cover all of that in, in another video that I did called the wounding factors. But um, the B zone is going to be useful from that end of the A zone, which is going to be three to five yards. Now, of course, that could be extended out to as far as seven yards with a, a shotgun that has something like a Van Comp choke. But now we're talking... We're talking a range of from three to five yards with standard barrel guns out to 20 to 25 yards uh, with standard barrel guns. And then anywhere from like five to seven to 20 to 30, or rather 30 to 35 yards with a choked shotgun. That's only something you're going to determine once you get out on the range and you pattern your gun with your load and determine what it, what it will do. But everything for me with most of my shotguns, I own everything from 25 into contact. I own that with buckshot. I don't have any problem taking a buckshot um, um, sh or a shot with buckshot out to as far as 25 yards. When I get to that point, and I know where 25 yards is. I, that's burned into my brain. I spent way too much time on a range. When I'm at 25 yards, I'm already starting to think, okay, distance is now becoming a factor. I'm, I'm concerned about the pellets, so I am now, or rather, I'm concerned about pellets, you know, bypassing my target completely. Um, I'm now going to be thinking in terms of tightening things right back up to muzzle diameter and going to a solid projectile, and that's going to be our C zone. And our C zone is going to be from the end of the B zone, which is 20 to 25 yards of standard barrel guns, 30 to 35 with choke guns, out to the limits of the sighting system or the actual slug itself. Now, I say the slug itself because the two are pretty close, actually. With a bead sight, you can make pretty good hits from 25 out to 50. When you get beyond 50, it is difficult to hit with a bead sight because you just have that one round ball on the end of your barrel, and you have really nothing to align it with except maybe some striations on the top of your receiver. It's not a very effective sighting system for any kind of long-range precision. I have hit a man-sized target at 150 yards of the bead-sided gun. And for that matter, it was a 12 and a half inch barrel gun. Um, but that was very difficult to do, and I was able to pull it off, but it wouldn't be something I would ever actually want to do for real. Uh, so after that, I did start looking into improved sighting systems on guns that I would be using under those circumstances. I happen to, to like express sights or rifle sights, if you will. Um, Ghost ring sights are another option, and of course there's red dot optics and other optics uh, that can be applied. So that can extend that useful range. Now, when we're talking 12-gauge slug, of course we know that at 100 yards this thing loses half of its muzzle energy and has about 5 inches of drop. 
Uh, so really beyond 100, it's sketchy to begin with, and you're not going to be hitting as effectively, but I'll, I'll throw this in there. The average law enforcement sniper engagement is about 75 yards. Um, there's not a lot of circumstances or situations I could envision a, as either a law enforcement officer or a, a civilian taking any kind of a shot beyond 150 yards. Even beyond 100 yards would be hard to explain. There are some exigent circumstances where that come, could come into play, and I'm sure there's some guys from LAPD that would argue with me about that um, uh, after North Hollywood. Um, but even having said that, those were still kind of within that envelope. They're really, I, did, I didn't see anybody really operating out beyond 100 yards on that one. But having said that, um, when it comes to working within that C zone, you are going to be definitely limited by the sighting system. Uh, so whatever improvements you do in that regard can help. Uh, but this, uh, again, we're talking about moving everything back to a solid projectile and operating this gun just like you would a rifle or a carbine. So... That's a basic synopsis of the operating zones of the shotgun. Of course, I have a follow-up video on this. The importance of patterning your shotgun with different loads so that you can select the one that performs the best within your gun, knowing that, again, not all loads pattern the same way for all guns, and not all guns pattern the same way with the same load. Um, and just the overall importance of just if you're going to be a responsible tactical shotgunner, you need to know your load, know what it will do, and know what it will do at every conceivable distance you're going to be operating that shotgun from. So, uh, again, as I said, I'm following up this video with some actual live fire demos. I've got a couple of different uh, videos on patterning in the shotgun, as well as uh, operating within the A, B, and C zone. Probably the next one to go up after this will be that. And then I've got... Uh, uh, a pretty good video on how to do a select slug drill so that when you get into that C zone and you'll know what we're talking about at that point, uh, it shows how to get a slug or a couple of slugs into that gun as quickly as possible and stay in the fight at extended distances. So that pretty much sums it up. That's all I want to talk about on this particular video. Thank you for listening. Uh, this is Scott with Spectre Gear and have a wonderful day.